This is a Sega Dreamcast disc. This is not a music CD. If you continue, you run the risk of transmitting deadly viral diseases to your household electronic appliances. Jeez, some people. Recently, I found a renewed interest in the good old Dreamcast, Sega's final foray into the console market before shuttering their hardware division and becoming solely a software developer and publisher. Theories range from why the Dreamcast did Sega in the way it did. Was it the lack of a DVD drive, something that the PS2 had out of the box? Was it the Dreamcast being underpowered compared to its competitors from Sony, Nintendo, and Microsoft? Was it all the goodwill Sega had burnt up with its developers after the failures that were the 32X and the Saturn in most Western territories? Like I said, everyone has their version of the story, but the long and short of it is that the Dreamcast was Sega's final home console to see release, sporting a short lifespan in Europe and America, while enjoying considerably more support in its home country. I grew up with this console, being in elementary school when it was released and my brother first got one. For a long time though, it was sitting in the closet, gathering dust. As of late, however, I've been noticing a few things about the Sega Dreamcast, namely that there's a lot more to its game library than the classics. It's not really something you consider as a kid. When you're that age, you play what's in front of you, or whatever catches your eye through TV and magazine ads. Whoa, what's this? There's a Sonic Adventure 2? And I can make my Chao look evil? I desperately need to go f when you're a bit older, though, you start to look back at those old titles and new lights. Were all the classics really that great? What about those games you wrote off as looking dumb or childish, when you were yourself a condescending 12-year-old? There are two factors that make the Dreamcast even more appealing to someone like me. The first is that it was developed by Sega. Whether it was a lack of communication between their three primary branches, or just because Sega was insane, you can't help but admit that our Sonic-led friends from Japan were willing to throw cash and R&D time at just about anything. I mean, consider how in Japan, the Dreamcast had a webcam and accompanying software, designed to make it a chat machine. Take a look further back and you'll see that the Saturn had some limited networking capabilities, though the Dreamcast did one better and included a 56k modem out of the box. Or think about how a health insurance company partnered with Sega to utilize the Dreamcast's online functions for telehealth services for its members. And that's just getting at the online portion of the Dreamcast's weirdness. The other important factor was the Dreamcast's prolonged life in Japan, where America and Europe each saw several hundred games released for the system before Sega cut official support and stopped pressing their proprietary GD-ROMs or Gigabyte Disk ROMs. Japan, on the other hand, yeah, there were more than 600 titles in total. This means that, as Japanese language learners, there's a wealth of study material available. See ma, I can have my cake and eat it too. Learning can be fun. And that's to say nothing, of course, of the decade plus since the console's demise, in which numerous independent titles have been released for the Dreamcast. This is thanks to an exploit discovered in how the system reads discs in which a game can be disguised more or less as an audio track. Why does this work? Well, because of yet another peripheral, a karaoke attachment, where the user would place special karaoke discs in the Dreamcast. These karaoke discs had little bits of data on top of the audio, which told the Dreamcast to play special visualizations and the like. Long story short, you can burn a regular old CDR with the right bits of code to exploit this, and convince the Dreamcast to boot into a fully playable game. In other words, the wet dream of an indie developer with an interest in the sixth generation of consoles looking to put out some snazzy indie releases. There's one other aspect of the Dreamcast that's a bit odd, shall we say? A lot of those Japanese titles we mentioned a moment ago are dating sims and visual novels, mostly PC ports with the more lewd scenes censored or removed. There are also a good number of Japanese FMV games. For those not in the know, full motion video or FMV games are the type which utilize on-camera appearances by live action actors to tell a story that's more like a choose your own adventure book than a straight adventure game. FMV games were pushed exceptionally hard by, who else? Sega earlier in the 1990s with the inception of the Sega CD. If you know anything about the notorious nature of some of the Sega CD FMV titles, you can probably guess why the genre never really caught on in the West. In Japan, on the other hand, they maintained a relatively small niche following even into the new millennium. 
It's releases like this, the FMV games, the dating sims, and the veritable deluge of visual novels that make some scoff at the idea of collecting games for the Dreamcast in the first place. What is one to do with 400 or so games they can't read or understand that all feature awkward FMV sequences or big bosomed anime babes vying for the player's love? Well, unless you're a language learner, like we said. In fact, some of these titles are known as really expensive coasters. This term is mostly relegated to games that are at this point unplayable, namely games which required an internet connection, but for which the servers have long since died. What's worse than not speaking the language? Not being able to play the game. And what's even worse than not being able to play the game? Well, that takes us to today's subject. A Dreamcast release that required an internet connection, and which at this point is considered a crown jewel among collectors. Why does it belong on Cinema Nippon, though? Truth be told, this release wasn't even a game. It was an ongoing web series released within a one-year window which required an internet connection and which now holds the record as a set of the Dreamcast's most expensive coasters. Here, dear viewer, we have Grauen no Torikago. Also, speaking of these things being exceptionally expensive coasters, we have to give a major thanks and shout out to fellow YouTuber Adam Koralik. This hot boy is one of the premier sources of Dreamcast information on the platform, covering everything from obscure peripherals to new indie releases whenever they arrive. We reached out to Adam, given that, yeesh, yeah, these things were not in our budget, and Adam was gracious enough to provide us with the video you've been seeing on screen. Without his help, we wouldn't have all these interviews, crystal clear peeks at the menus of each disc, and those beautiful error messages that Sega's servers can't be reached. If you're looking for further info on the weirder parts of the Dreamcast's legacy and library, be sure to give Adam a sub and delve into his 150 plus Keep Dreaming series. For those more interested in an in-depth look at video game generations, check out any of his recap playlists. Adam is a pretty chill guy from what we've seen, and he's doing good work on his channel. That being said, let's look at the fruits of his years spent collecting. Grauen no Torikago, or Birdcage of Grauen, a German word meaning horror, is not necessarily notable for its actual contents. From what we can tell, it's a six hour long drama series concerning a young woman named Nao Kakuda, who's played by Sayaka Yoshino. The series opening sees Nao moving into a new apartment building, Grauenheim, or Horror Home. What a lovely place this one must be. After moving in, she sets about getting to know the locals, only for these more mundane exploits to be cut short by a slew of grisly murders. While these mysterious, dangerous, and even murderous events transpire, Nao and her new compatriots all must determine who can be trusted, and who among the residents of Grauenheim may actually be a killer on the loose. The series' premise sounds interesting enough, but could definitely make for a somewhat hokey, B-tier horror fare, which was common in the 1990s. We can't say for sure, that's just the impression we get. On the other hand, the utterly fascinating parts, the reasons we're even talking about the series in the first place, are the individuals behind Grauen no Torikago, the method in which it was produced, and the legacy it's left behind. For starters, we have the lead, Sayaka Yoshino, an actress since 1994 who was a mere teenager when she landed the lead role in Grauen. Working since she was a girl in modeling film and television, admirers of fine Japanese film will recognize Yoshino from her first two major roles in Hirokazu Koreeda's first theatrical projects, Mabaroshi and its follow-up, Afterlife. Given her young age upon entering the world of entertainment, Yoshino was considered what's known as a chaidoru, or a child idol. This proved to be a tough life in some respects, with Yoshino not finishing high school on time, and only later receiving a high school degree. She seems to have made it out alright, however, having now gotten married and becoming an animal rights activist, hosting a program known as Hello from Earth, which highlighted shelter animals in need of rescue. Yoshino is also a vocal advocate of the fair trade movement, and she's done all of this while continuing her, at this point, lengthy career in film and television. Behind the camera, matters were equally fascinating. Grauen's script was penned by Kazuaki Takano, a member of the Mystery Writers of Japan. Born in 1964, Takano, as a teen, wanted to work in film and made 8mm films in elementary and junior high school, as have some other filmmakers we've covered on the channel. He completed his first full script in college before going on to work under Kihachi Okamoto in the mid-1980s. You'll remember Okamoto as the man behind the sci-fi drama Blue Christmas, among many others. 
Takano then moved on to study film between 1989 and 1991 at the Los Angeles City College. This was merely phase one of Takano's career, however. Around the turn of the millennium, he began publishing novels rather than moving further into film work. Takano was awarded the Edogawa Rampo Prize in 2001 for his first full novel, Thirteen Steps, a story dealing with the troubled relationship between Japan and capital punishment. After this critical success, he went on to win four more literary awards, all for his later novel, Genocide of One, released first in 2011 and translated into English in 2014. Jumping back to 1999, the year of Grauen no Torikago, this was not Takano's first rodeo in the script department. After dropping out of college, he went to work on at least five dramas in 1992, all short limited series. The next year, he returned to work on the film Let's Go to the Diet, co-written by Hiroshi Saito and directed by Haruo Ichikura. This one was a comedy about Japan's legislative system, which unfortunately has not been translated into English. After going to the diet, Takano disappeared until 1999, with Grauen no Torikago, then several more dramas, then a steady stream until the present of movies adapted from his novels. Production duties on Grauen fell to perhaps the most storied individual working on the project, one Yasushi Akimoto. To put it bluntly, Akimoto has his finger in a lot of pies. Key lime, raspberry, pecan, chicken pot pie. He's served as producer on a number of shows and movies, wrote a few, and directed a handful. Akimoto also wrote the novels upon which the One Missed Call trilogy was based, though his bibliography doesn't stop there. Perhaps more well-known is Akimoto's work writing lyrics and producing music and videos for a number of pop groups. Most notably, he is variously credited as helping to create the phenomenon that is AKB48, or else one of their creators. More clearly, Akimoto spearheaded the formation of at least one of their foreign sister groups. Akimoto decided that 2019 was the year of the baby idol group. No, not baby metal. Like, literal babies. To celebrate the new Japanese era brought on by the crowning of Emperor Naruhito, he thought it appropriate to enlist a number of pregnant women who were set to give birth during the newly opened Reiwa period. He named the group RWA Zero, in keeping with the name Reiwa and the age of the participants. According to official press releases, the babies were set to release their first single late last year. But as of now, details after the announcement seem scarce. Oh, and none of this is to say anything of Akimoto being named one of the producers of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics opening ceremonies. This was such a big announcement to some who took ingress with Akimoto's hand in AKB48 that an online petition was set up to remove him from the post. In the words of those against Akimoto at the Olympics, his work in Japanese pop music marks the death of art in Japan. With all of that in mind, we think it's fair to say that something as unique as one of the first proper web series, not to mention the first released through a console, was fertile ground for someone like Akimoto. Lastly, Grauen no Torikago was directed by Naoto Yamakawa, who is not to be confused with the manga author of the same name. Noticeably, the series is missing from most of his online filmographies for some strange reason. Yamakawa recalls seeing spaghetti westerns on TV in his teens being the event which pushed him to, quote, move in the direction of movies, end quote. Growing up in Shinshiro, Yamakawa says there were no local cinemas, meaning he had to travel to Toyahashi or Nagoya instead to see movies on the silver screen. This became such a pastime for him that Yamakawa moved on to film work in college at Waseda University. In just three years between 1978 and 1980, he and his fellow students made five short and medium-length films. Yamakawa continued to work throughout the 1980s, adapting two short stories by Haruki Murakami, helping edit Sogo Ishii's groundbreaking punk masterpiece Burst City, then realizing his spaghetti western vision in 1986 with The New Morning of Billy the Kid. Supposedly, according to JMDB, Takano and Yamakawa flopped their writing and directing roles in the fifth and sixth releases for Grauen. We're not sure why their database has it listed this way, however, as scans of the sixth VHS release clearly denote that their roles remained consistent throughout the runtime of the entire franchise. The series was created by ASCII EC, a portion of ASCII Corporation. 
Those who have played around with any number of older Japanese video games may recognize ASCII as a long-running developer and publisher. The company is a multimedia conglomerate responsible for a number of projects over the decades like the MSX, the original home of Metal Gear, the RPG Maker franchise, and many more. Given how closely Sega worked with ASCII on the project, a good bit of Sega branding is included in the show, including characters using a Dreamcast as a clue towards solving the mystery. It's easy to see that a notable cast, crew, and pair of companies were assembled to work on Grauen no Torikago. Perhaps the even more notable aspect of all of this, however, is the method in which the series was broadcast. The idea for Grauen was simple. Roughly six hours of content spread across one calendar year. That meant one episode was released per day, at about a minute apiece. We would speculate that this was partially done due to the lack of major bandwidth back in 1999 and 2000 when the series was released. Rather than having to wait hours for a 20 minute episode to download once per week, viewers could spend maybe an hour or less downloading per day to keep up. This was fully circumvented by the inclusion of a Dreamcast release, which had all the video files on the disc. Rather than downloading a chunk of data each day in the form of a video file, then going through the pain of playing it in Windows Media Player or Real Player, all one had to do was ping Sega's servers, download a bite-sized save file to their visual memory unit, the Dreamcast's fancy pants memory card, and enjoy. This release schedule also meant that viewers were drip-fed information as time went on, keeping them engaged without even a day going by where they might drop out due to forgetfulness or boredom. To further deepen the viewer connection, a bulletin board system and website were set up to help those who might not catch every episode. These areas provided short text updates, as well as providing a location for the congregation of viewers where they could swap theories on who the murderer was and what might happen next. You could say that these were all symptomatic of growing pains to online distribution. The technology wasn't there yet for high def, 1080p, 4K, what kind of And unfortunately, this means that a lot of the content is simply gone now, especially anything user generated on this lost BBS. According to the website Internet Watch, a subtitled international release was considered by ASCII at one point, though unfortunately the international market was one with which they never followed through. We'd like to imagine that, had this been explored more thoroughly, Grauen and its internet offshoots, like the BBS and website, may have been better archived. Of course, we're talking about a solid decade before the popular inception of social media, so even this may be wishful thinking. The long and short of matters, though, is that as it stands, we are left only with Grauen no Torikago in an unsubtitled form and without any of its supplementary material. The most interesting part, perhaps, is what was left behind with the Dreamcast version of the series. The Dreamcast release of Grauen no Torikago was handled differently than the browser release, given how differently a Dreamcast operates compared with a PC. The Dreamcast, as you might expect at the time, had no internal hard drive. This meant that the only way in which the console could download data was to its VMU. These suckers contain a standard 200 blocks, the block being their name for measuring storage capacity. 200 blocks is equivalent to 100 kilobytes, which, yeah, you're not getting much video stored in 100k. The solution, then, was to store the videos on the Dreamcast discs for Grauen. In order to keep viewers from jumping ahead of schedule, the internet was still incorporated, using the VMU in its own way to download the aforementioned save data, which would unlock the videos on the disc, keeping pace with the online distribution of the series. According to Sega Retro, without these saves, the discs are more or less useless. Nowadays, the videos would need to be extracted from the data of the discs, or a special VMU save would need to be created in order to use the Grauen discs as intended. And given that the servers from which Grauen saves were downloaded went offline almost immediately after the series concluded, the lifespan of these titles was short-lived to say the least. Sega released six volumes of Grauen no Torikago throughout its run. These titles were available on a bi-monthly basis known as Capitals 1 through 6. Again, in keeping with the German theming, capital means chapter, hence these being chapters 1 through 6. Each capital contained about 60 episodes of the show so that viewers would have the discs well in advance of each episode's broadcast date. In total, the Dreamcast releases were available between September 30th, 1999 and July 27th, 2000, though things were a bit more complicated than even this may let on. 
While Sega was more than willing to work with experimental concepts and small developers, they likely realized right out of the gate that this internet drama idea wasn't going to exactly do gangbusters with their new console. As a result, each disc was sold only through Dreamcast Direct. This site was Sega's contemporary online store exclusive to Japan, which was later rebranded Sega Direct. Through Dreamcast Direct, Japanese users could purchase exclusive Sega-branded content, which narrowed the availability of titles like Grauen no Torikago. According to archivists on the internet, each subsequent disc was only available to, or at least playable by, those who had completed the earlier entries. This explains why on the second-hand market, Grauen releases increase in price with each subsequent capital. While enough people may have been hooked by Capital One, come Capital Five, many will have lost interest or forgotten about the series. For reference, each Capital was 2,800 yen at release, about 30 US dollars. Now, Capital Two will easily go for 10,000 yen, more than $100, while Capital Five will sell for 30,000 yen, about $300. Understandably, Capital Six has garnered a reputation as one of the most expensive releases for the Sega Dreamcast. It may be wrong to say that the Grauen GD-ROMs are complete coasters, as Adam Karalik discovered when recording the footage he provided for this video. As it turns out, each Capital didn't only contain the series. Each also provided access to something called the Present Corner, which apparently allowed users to access weekly gifts. We can't find any information on what these gifts may have been, and naturally, they're long gone. On the other hand, each disc contained one additional video, except for one. The first four capitals each have an interview, one with the lead actress, one with the producer, one with the writer, and one with the director. Capital 5 provides viewers with a full soundtrack of the series, which is just as funkified in the 90s as you might imagine. Ironically, Capital Six, the crown jewel in expense, has nothing more than the same old Grauen Theater and Present Corner. No bonuses whatsoever. Total jip. Later, Grauen no Torikago was released on VHS by VAP Video in six volumes, in keeping with the Dreamcast releases. Nowadays, these VHSs are nowhere near as expensive as the Dreamcast games, but they're unfortunately still lacking in subtitles. Also of note is that for whatever reason, the VHS re-releases were listed at 9,800 yen, or a little over $100 upon release. That's quite a lot. As of yet, ironically, these VHSs seem to be the best method of viewing Grauen no Torikago. After the online and Dreamcast releases, both of which are now gone, this is the only available release. This is why we say the VHSs are ironic for their mastery. It turns out Grauen, one of the first web series, hasn't been properly digitized. It's not streaming anywhere, it's not on Blu-ray, and it's not even on DVD. So there you have it, Grauen no Torikago, simultaneously six of the most expensive releases for the Dreamcast, a bold new idea that has since fallen into obscurity, and one of the most intriguing shows or movies we've covered which, for most intents and purposes, you can't watch. The 20th anniversary of the show's initial broadcast may have come and gone, but hopefully someday we'll see this horror mystery drama given its proper due. Maybe someone in the Dreamcast's dedicated community of homebrewers and developers will create a set of self-booting discs for Grauen, which don't require the internet connection of the original discs. Let us know in the comments what you think of this bizarre rabbit hole we've recently uncovered. What other shows and movies are you aware of which have fallen into the same levels of obscurity as Grauen no Torikago? And if you've happened to ever see the show, what are your thoughts on Grauen and its odd legacy?